Hare Krishna Dandavat Chaitanya Charandas here. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Om Gyan Ati Mirandasya Gyanan Jana Shalakaya Chakshurun Milatam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Hare Krishna So we have been discussing the six limbs of surrender and in the first session I talked about how surrender can be compared with a military general's defeated general surrender to the victorious general or it can be compared to a patient surrendering to a doctor and also how a lover surrenders to the beloved. That is the third metaphor which I discussed in later class briefly. So the medical metaphor was what I explored in the first session. In the second session, I talked about accepting the favorable and avoiding the unfavorable. And how that, that is the active dimension of surrender. It's something which you have to constantly keep doing. It's action. And with respect to our association, with respect to our uh, the philosophy, we fo focus on that which is favorable. And in yesterday's session, I talked about how we need a, how can we have that faith that Krishna is our protector when protection may not seem to be apparent. So I talked about Krishna can be, we, we don't see Krishna as the cause of our suffering because there is multiple factors involved. There is God's will, there is free will, and there is evil. So Krishna is not the cause of our suffering. Sometimes Krishna can be the cure for our suffering. But even when he is not the cure, he can be the shield amid the suffering. He can be the comforter amid the suffering. So for Draupadi, he was the cure. For Parikshit, he was the shield. Uh, he, so now, uh, today I'll talk about, the, so that, that was the next two elements. Today I'll talk about the last two elements. Atmanikshep karpanne shadvidha sharanagati atmanikshepa. So, Atma is self, nikshepa. Uh, offering our entire self to Krishna and karpanne, understanding that we are worthless without Krishna. We are weak, we are powerless without Krishna. So, here I will talk mainly about the uh, I'll relate this with again with Anukula Sankalpa Patikula Sevarjinam. Although those are actions and the last four are dispositions, but I'll talk about how we need to have a healthy conception about ourselves. And this healthy conception means that we don't we don't beat ourselves down in the name of humility. In our devotee circles, we usually talk about not uh, Puffing ourselves up with pride, and that's of course, uh, with ego, that's of course very important and that's an ever present danger. But we may mistake humility to self flagellation, to beating oneself. Oh, I'm useless, I'm worthless, I'm good for nothing, I'm so fallen. And that is, um, that is not. Uh, Always, that is not the way humility will enhance our devotion. So the idea over here is that let's consider this Atmanik shape. We want to offer our entire being to Krishna, understanding that without such offering, that without connecting myself with Krishna, I am worthless. So let's consider in some other offering we are doing. Say if we are cooking some food and offering to Krishna. Now, we might not have very opulent food to offer. Like say, Sudama's family, they didn't have much opulent food. But so they, they had some, just some, some chipped rice. And they took it and offered it. And they also couldn't pack it in any grand pack. It was just a simple cloth. It was bound together. But still, they took it and they offered it to Krishna. Uh, Sudama took it, his wife gave it to him and he took it and offered it. So Krishna also says that I accept even simple things that are offered. Patram pushpam phalam toyam yome bhaktya prayachati 
tadaham bhakti upahritam ashnami prayatatmanaha. I say something as simple as a fruit, a flower, or even a glass of water or a leaf, I will accept if you offer it to me with a devotion. What this means is that <clears throat> while we have humility, it's definitely required. Humility doesn't mean that we just keep beating ourselves down. The point is that we also want to pick ourselves up and offer ourselves, offer ourselves at the very best that we can. Suppose we have simple food and we don't have the money to purchase uh, good food. But then at least what we could do, I have simple food, but let me put it on the cleanest plate that I have and let me offer that simple food. So, so that's what we would do. Even if we can't buy expensive food for a guest or even for Krishna for offering on the altar. You try to put it on the cleanest plate. So similarly, when we are to offer ourselves to Krishna, we need to understand that each one of us has significance because we are parts of Krishna. Krishna as uh, Krishna has eternally made us his part. So at one level. We understand that we are insignificant because there are so many, the world is so big, the universe is so big, the material existence is so big, and there are so many parts of Krishna. But still, every part counts. Every one of us mm. is a part of Krishna, a part so precious that Krishna decides to personally be present in our heart as the super soul. So if now, if, suppose, we don't consider something worth offering, then we might not cook also very well. We might uh, be half-hearted in serving it properly. And then that offering, if some guests has come to our house and we are, serve, we are offering them a poor food with a poor attitude, then that will jar much more, the attitude will jar much more than the food. So similarly, yes, you know, if I had this talent, if I had this self-control, if I had this tolerance, I might have been so much better. That's okay. But this is how I am. And I accept myself and I offer myself to Krishna. So such self-acceptance is vital. Self-acceptance doesn't mean that the way I am, I am wonderful, I am perfect. No. It means, yes, there's a lot I could improve, but the way I am, I am still offerable to Krishna. The way I am, I still can do something to offer myself to Krishna. Everyone is intrinsically a part of Krishna. Everyone has that, uh, that privilege which Krishna has given us. And when we have this self acceptance that krishna this is this is this is what i am and I offer myself to you so in this case we could say surrender means surrender means to do what we can with what we have now i repeat surrender means to do what we can with what we have now so krishna i am so conditioned that i cannot I have, I'm, I'm trapped with such a body mind. I have such a social situation, such a family situation, such a financial situation. I can't do this, 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 this. There's so little I can do. But this is what I can do and this is what I will do. Maybe in future when the situation becomes better, I will do much more. But right now, this is what I will do. So surrender means uh, accepting ourselves so that we can go about offering ourselves to Krishna. Sometimes, in our own mind, if we have not accepted ourselves, we are just beating ourselves. You are so worthless. You are so good for nothing. Then much of our energy is going in beating ourselves and in being beaten by ourselves. And then, very little of our energy is left to even offer to Krishna. So, this, we, we have our conditionings and we have, we have weaknesses. But 
we don't we don't have to whitewash ourselves and imagine that i am so great that i can be a great devotee of krishna but as however i am still krishna accepts me and let me offer myself to him so this is uh, atmanikshep before we can offer ourselves we need to accept ourselves mm. and <clears throat> it's like say somebody tells us say we are we are going from here to vrindavan for yatra and somebody tells us you know can you just take this and offer this to krishna balram in vrindavan offer this whatever if if there's some food we can carry or some necklace or something like that now if we think that that is not worthy enough to be carried you know what is this it's such a tiny thing it's such a bad bad quality thing you cannot give it to krishna you cannot offer it to krishna then we may not even accept it to carry it or even if we carry it we might lose it on the way or even if we carry it we might mishandle it it might get spoiled and even if we carry it and all the way and offer it well what our attitude will still be negative so we won't get much credit of having carried something to offer to krishna so one so similarly we can apply that to ourselves you know the most fundamental resource that we all have for offering to krishna is we ourselves and yes as a part of we ourselves or extending from we ourselves we have our wealth we have our talents we have our contacts we have our qualities we have the various services that we can do that we are doing but through it all it's actually we are offering ourselves to krishna so we need to accept ourselves that yes despite my limitations it, i am i can offer myself to krishna we see bhakti vinod thakur and others they have such they as such we could say almost abject humility in their songs amara jeevana sada paperata and my life is filled with sin of course their life isn't filled with sin at all but that is the way they are thinking about themselves and despite thinking about themselves the conclusion is not that oh there is no hope for me that krishna apart from you there is no hope for me that means they are they are not so hopeless that they think even krishna that krishna is not a hope rather they still they have the firm faith that krishna is the hope so going back to the medical metaphor you know first i talked about how we need to have faith that the doctor can cure us and that's uh, that's yesterday's talk that is rakshishiti ti vishwaso goptutve varnam kotha but along with that we also have to have the faith that i am curable that and that is what is being talked about in this atmanikshep and karpanyi that krishna you that, that you know i am going to offer myself to you if somebody even before going to a hospital believes that before going to a doctor believes that okay my disease is terminal there's no cure available then how will they offer themselves to the doctor so on one side there is a faith required that i am curable so that is atmanikshi you know, i am going to offer myself and karpanya is that okay without krishna there is no cure so there is definitely an awareness of the gravity of the situation but there is also an awareness of the possibility of rectifying the situation so atmanikshep and karpanya now sometimes now i am talking about all this in the context of sharanagati sometimes our mind may be in entirely different zone where we may not even think i am sick may think everything is fine with me now if that is the illusion we are in then we need some strong philosophical education so that's like maybe our ego has become so strong that we think that i'm comfortable in the world i'm okay then we need some strong treatment in that case also so it's like when a person is a little drunk then they have gone to a bar they're drunk they take a few two minute drinks and they realize i can't walk mm. so recently i was in chicago and a devotee we were we had a program and a devotee 
was driving me back so we were going passing by passing through a hotel a big five star hotel and there there was a old man who just waved to us and he was talking in a slurred speech so i initially thought that you know this is probably a drunk i had never seen like a drunk on the streets he was waving doddering so i saw this devotee immediately stopped the car and he said you know what happened says, can you just take me to the front side you know i came out here i can't walk now so he was drunk then the person was the older like probably 70 80 or something like that so that devotee and i we helped him get to the car and he he was like a client in that car and a customer in that big five star hotel itself and he was elderly so we just sat, got him into the car and just took him across to the front gate just like a few but he couldn't walk that much also and then he walked in from there the guard came and helped him so the point is if somebody is a little drunk they are aware that they are drunk and then they seek help but if somebody is heavily drunk then even if somebody comes to help them i'll say uh, oh that i am drunk ah fine get lost or something like that they will uh, not even acknowledge they are drunk that's how drunk they are so the same way you know we are all fallen it's like we are in a drunk state and we need help but if we don't think we are fallen then we are really fallen it's like we are so drunk that we are not even aware we are drunk so that's a different zone and if we were in that zone we wouldn't even be talking about surrender uh so i won't explore that that we, sometimes if we are we have put ourselves raise ourselves too high we need to bring ourselves down a few pegs so that we are not so full of ourselves not so proud but when we are talking about surrender uh we need these uh, two two ways of looking at ourselves that i am curable and without taking a cure without administering the medicine uh this could be terrible so so that the dual aspects of the hope that if i take if i take a medicine i can be cured if i don't it can be disastrous so therefore we can both ways be impelled to surrender to krishna to to take the medicine and in our context to surrender to krishna so humility a karpanye it is like i am worthless i am hopeless it's primarily it's who i'm hopeless without krishna so i was talking about bhakti vinod thakur they talk about such abject humility but none of that object humility stops bhakti vinod thakur from saying krishna you are my hope and beyond you there is no hope but it doesn't think that i am so fallen that even krishna can't help me so surrender requires that that understanding that i, I am curable atmanik shape so i'll offer my whole being to you krishna that you can take i might be like a i might just be like a just some garbage which is fallen on the road but an expert person can even take take various items of garbage and make something useful out of it prabhupad says how an expert musician can maybe take a coconut shell take a stick take a cloth which is lying on the ground take some string which is lying on the ground and pick it up and make that into a and play some music with those four things so like that krishna is expert enough to to cure us to make us make us pure to make us spiritual to make us wonderful so when we have this attitude toward ourselves that i am curable but i need med- i need to seriously but without the cure without taking the cure this is going to be terrible then we can move forward so this is yesterday i talked about one ex- one part of sharanagati is uh, what jesus says that you know let thy will be done i whatever you do o oh lord i accept it tumi sarveshwar eshwar bhakti nath thakur says you are the you are the supreme controller and your will reigns supreme that's that's one aspect of surrender so basically i talked about how there are some things in our control and there are many things beyond our control so in the overall way things outside of us are happening we accept krishna whatever is your will i accept it mm. uh, let thy will be done 
but then there are some things in my control and for those uh, we have krishna's arjuna's mood in the bhagavad gita karishe vachanam tava i will do your will now of course when we say that i will do your will how much we can do krishna's will that may vary now arjuna can fight uh, against a whole army he is such a illustrious warrior now we might be able to do something very small and less as compared to that but each of us can do our things so i will do your will means okay it may be according to my capacity like earlier i said surrender means to do what we can with what we have now so what we so whatever i can do let me do that and here it is good for at least for some time when to to treat ourselves to look at ourselves from an outside perspective treat yourself like someone we are responsible for that means if we were guiding someone in their spiritual life then how would we guide them to move toward krishna maybe you can know, you are going the situation going through the situation you can do this you can try this so we can do the have that attitude that okay i am here this is here what can i do wow. so treat yourself like someone you care for someone you are responsible for someone you value someone you value not just in the sense that oh you are perfect but rather you have potential see it's like our mind is always going to be like a child but our intelligence has to be like a parent now parents when they value their children there are two aspects to that mm. that at one level the parents need to accept the children as they are but if the parents tell the child you are perfect right now well no the child has child doesn't have perfection the child has potential and one part of the parents love is to feel make sure the child feels loved as they are right now but another part of the parents love is to also ensure that the child's potential is manifested and whatever is required for the child's potential to manifest the parents take responsibility to do that and sometimes it requires some pushing sometimes it requires some rebuking sometimes it requires some discipline but at other times it requires encouraging it requires comforting sometimes it requires appreciating so we so our mind is going to be like a child and we in the sense of our intelligence needs to become like a parent and okay this is where you are what can you do right now so with respect to surrender now to develop this positive uh, like i am worth i'm worthwhile i please i am curable if you want to not worthwhile in the egoistic sense but i am curable if so i talk about two things atmanikshep and karpanya that i am curable and without this cure there is no uh, there there is going to be things are going to be terrible so this idea that i am responsible for someone that helps us to get this conception that i am curable that yes i can be cured um but sorry the idea that i, I have to take responsibility for myself means that that this is if this is not treatment is not taken things are going to be very serious so take responsibility make sure that we do what we can and how can we surrender to krishna that is that i am curable that comes how do i believe that i am curable even if if i if i see some improvement say if i had a, if i have a fracture and there's a lot of pain but earlier my hand was motionless now a little motion has returned in my fingers the pain may not have gone away but some motion has returned so we see some sign of cure and not just motion has returned now motion doesn't return at automatically now if somebody had a fracture they have to exert to move their hands but when they exert they are able to move initially after the injury even if they exert they may not be able to move but gradually the motion returns so basically when we come to surrender the way we surrender is set up some tangible thing we can do for krishna 
okay krishna i'm in this terrible situation i'm powerless but this is all i can do maybe i decide that you know right now i'm feeling very much down and i, I can read one page of the bhagavad every day for this for this chaturmasya i'll read one page of the bhagavad okay that's as uh, one page is doable or maybe one per port sometimes it might be one page some half a page sometimes two pages whatever you decide that and every day if we do it now we may say oh, one one per port is very difficult okay then decide one verse one verse is possible i okay, have one verse is surely possible and if if i know no but some days i'm so busy i can't read even one verse or oh, really maybe that's that's not i don't know if anybody is that busy but even if they say like okay and some days i can't read one verse the next day i'll read two verses so in one week i'll read seven verses this is baby steps here the important thing is not how much quantity we do but the point that we do something yeah i thought i couldn't do anything but i was able to do this and then that becomes like our evidence that yes we are curable i thought i couldn't do this but i did this and that way what happens our we have tangible evidence about our curability so surrender means that we do small things that we can in a mood of service to krishna small simple steps s s s small simple steps nothing very complicated nothing very big just small simple steps uh, sometimes devotees ask you know, how do we read sila prabhupada's books so there are different ways we can give answers one answer simple is you know is pick up the book open the book place your eyes on the lines and move your eyes along the lines in the book that's all there is to it so sometimes the mind makes a big fuss out of things just small simple steps so if we do that we'll find that yes i can do and as we start saying we can do that that we are surrendering to krishna and we are connecting with krishna and then that increases our faith and our curability and then we feel inspired to surrender more and that's how surrender grows more and more gradually and that's how ultimately in a very practical way we can exhibit surrender to krishna so uh, this is how we can apply sharanagati in our life so i'll summarize uh, what i spoke first to in today's class and then uh, about what i overall the six limbs of sharanagati how they can be put together uh, and then we'll have almost about 30 minutes 25 30 minutes for questions if any of you have we can ask there is one or two questions which already devotees messaged i'll begin with them if there's no question immediately coming so to summarize i spoke about in today's talk about uh, how we need to see ourselves atmanikshepa karpanya means that krishna i offer my whole being to you and karpanya without you i am worthless so in the context of the medical metaphor this means that i am curable krishna and that without without taking a cure things are going to be terrible so we started by talking about our conception of ourselves is important just like we have a conception of god that he is he he is our protector then i have to have the conception that i am worth be protected so all in one sense we are insignificant that there are innumerable parts of krishna but yet we are significant because each one of us is a precious part of krishna so precious that krishna is personally present in our heart so uh, if we are too proud that's like if we don't think we are fallen if we don't think we are sick that we don't need treatment then that's like a person is so drunk that they don't even realize they are drunk that's bad very bad but uh, once we are sick if we start thinking i am so sick that there's no hope for me then we won't take treatment so we are never so fallen that krishna can't lift us up and that so we are worth lifting up and krishna can lift us up and if we don't lift up we won't, if we don't if we are not lifted up we won't just stay there we'll glide down further and further so that understanding uh, is important for us to move forward positively 
So to move forward positively means that we recognize our sickness and recognize our potential for healing, for cure. So it's like a our mind is always going to be like a child. We have to become like a parent to the child. So sometimes the child needs to feel accepted, valued, loved as they are. And sometimes the child needs to be pushed, rebuked, disciplined so that they can manifest their potential. So depending on our situation, we we have to treat ourselves like someone we are responsible for, like say our child, and then have the appropriate attitude toward our, ourselves, which will we accept ourselves as we are, and we also push ourselves so that we manifest our spiritual potential. So we talked about uh, when we we may have, we have to op- to offer ourselves to Krishna that we have to believe that we are offerable, even if the food that we are offering is simple. More important than the food that is offered is the attitude with which the food is offered. So if somebody tells us to carry something valuable to Rindavan from America, we need to feel that it is valuable enough to offer to Krishna Balram in Rindavan. So we have to believe that we are worthy enough to be offered to Krishna. Not in an egoistic sense, but in a sense of self-acceptance and self-valuation. And with that, with this healthy self-conception, what do we do? We understand that we take small, simple steps. Surrender means to do what we can with what we have right now. So we set some worthy goal for ourselves and take whatever steps are doable for us. And the, the, the doability of those steps becomes the evidence for our curability that we can show to our mind. And then we can move forward confidently. So surrender has, uh, we can move forward confidently towards surrendering to Krishna. And in the big picture, so surrender is uh, the first two limbs that accept the favorable, avoid the unfavorable. That's like a patient who has been, who's on treatment, constantly choosing so that they can improve their health. Those in terms of dynamic actions. Uh, and that requires a lot of proactivity and um, responsibility. Then I talked about when we are, so we do what is fav- what is favorable and what is unfavorable, avoid what is unfavorable while taking treatment, accept the prescriptions, avoid the prescriptions. But then while we are doing this, uh, our actions are important, but along with the actions, our conceptions are important. So two primary conceptions, conceptions about the doctor's potency to cure, and about the patient's uh, capacity to be cured. That we are the other patients. So I talked about so Rakshishiting Tivishwasa Gupta Trivanam Tathais, the doctor's capacity to cure, that Krishna will protect us. But he's already maintaining us, so why will he not protect us? And then our own curability that I talked about, Atmanikshepa Karpanya, I talked about today. So thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments? Yes, to your question, I can. Should I answer? I remember that question. Should I directly answer it? Okay, excellent. So, there's a question which uh, was asked in an earlier session about, or Prithvi will ask me, Mataji, about how do we separate the sin from the sinner? Uh, so, we love, this, uh, love the sinner, but we hate the sin. So, how do we go about doing that? That was the question, isn't it? Okay. Mm. So I answered that briefly, but let's look at uh, two, three examples. Let's look firstly at Sashila Prabhupada's example. Prabhupada, when he went to the West, now some of us, we may have this conception that Prabhupada was strong and uncompromising used strong words like fools and rascals very frequently. But if you look at Srila Prabhupada's early disciples, or not just all those who interacted with Srila Prabhupada, you know, most of them said that they never felt as loud and valued by anyone 
as they had felt by shri prabhupad even their they, many of them said our parents our friends our other teachers none of them valued and loved us as much as prabhupad did so mukund maharaj writes in his book miracle on second avenue that he had heard the talk of many speakers before talks of many speakers but and he would like to after hearing the talk go backstage and see what the speaker was like in real life so when he went this time he went after uh, the talk to meet shri prabhupad and he was delighted to see that swami was actually interested in him that swami had time to talk with him to hear what he was saying and and talk and really pay attention to him so he he felt very respected and valued just by that so prabhupad valued and respected even the hippies so what does that mean that means that he loved the sinners he did not make them feel judged and uh, demeaned and rejected although they were doing many things which were seriously objectionable but prabhupad did not reject them because of that prabhupad valued and respected and accepted them in spite of what all that had happened so similarly uh so what was this acceptance based on he saw them as precious parts of krishna at the same uh, and that acceptance was what connected them with him uh, that does not mean that prabhupad flinch from talking about how what all they needed to do to become better so again i think uh, the parent child example which i gave in the class is helpful that the parents love the children but still the parents need to sometimes strongly tell the children you cannot do this and forbid uh, certain actions especially those actions that are dangerous for the children so that is also a part of of love only when both parts are there and both parts are properly offered that one can move onward in one's life and do whatever is necessary so in our practical dealings with others now we have to consider if i consider take the parent child example there is an important aspect there that we have to see whether that is our relationship with someone if that is not the relationship then we may not we might just have to keep a distance from them uh if that is how we will practically apply this dynamic that will vary from person to person because the important thing is that each relationship is unique each relationship has its own uh dynamics like i said earlier sometimes a person might be drowning and we can't really help them now the best thing we could do to help them is maybe call the lifeguard not jump ourselves to help them so if we see that every soul is is essentially a part of krishna and as a part of krishna every one of them is actually divine everyone is divine but currently their divinity is covered in such a way that actually it can damage me also not just damage others it can damage me also then we will be able to do we will be able to see it's like a doctor and a sick patient now sometimes the uh, if we are not adequately protected we might get infected by it we care for the patient but it doesn't mean that we indiscriminately assume that we will be the one who can cure the patient maybe we are not the one we don't we are not equipped enough so we have to see what is the practical reality and act accordingly so uh, this uh, a child metaphor or a sick person metaphor are helpful we don't hate the sickness but we do we don't hate the sick person we do hate the sickness and we have to firstly make sure that we ourselves don't get infected by that sickness and if it is not possible for us to see that difference then we need to sometimes uh, and if still we have to be in that relationship and we tend to see some person very negatively because of some things that they do then we have to see uh, how that person is seen positively by someone else maybe some other people see that person positively 
and accordingly you hear from them okay i i tend to so it's like the person is here their their particular conditioning is here and their actions are here so what happens is we we just can't see beyond their actions and their conditioning that make them do those actions to the soul the pure part of krishna so and we may have been hurt by their conditioning and their actions and it's understandable but we are seeing from this perspective maybe somebody sees them from that perspective maybe their conditioning don't matter so much to that person uh, maybe they don't come up as a prominent thing in the dynamic of that relationship so try to see the person from a different perspective you know every relationship it like offers a different mirror through which or a different window into a person say say you i talk with you or you talk with me you know we get to know each other but then say you talk with some other preacher about me and then they tell about their interactions with me you get to know something else now of course they may have their biases they may have their they may be, they may uh, their their dynamic comes into the picture but just that we get a different window to the person how accurate that window is that we we may have to see from person to person but that way if we are too fixated in our own perception of that person it is helpful to uh look uh, to hear from other people who have got different experiences and that also helps us to separate the sin from the sinner and another thing that we could do for this purpose is to try to see not just that person but see to see how maybe those whom we respect maybe the spiritual master maybe a spiritual guides how they see that person so often we interact with people based on only you do this to me i do this to you but if we see that okay this person is also connected with this person and how i deal with them also reflects how i deal with my my spiritual master my spiritual guides whatever so that can also help us to regulate our actions and uh, that way we can uh, try to act appropriately does it answer the question thank you for your question are there any okay are you still are you guys now well i wouldn't go so far as to say correct yourself it is that we all have uh, different ways our mind works and we have to accept where we are and move forward so for some devotees it might be that uh, you know studying for 5 10 minutes or 15 minutes might not nourish them and they may feel that you know i need quality time to get absorbed in scripture if that is the way we are then that's fine we can read maybe one one and a half hours also whenever we get time see whatever we are able to do for krishna never minimize it we don't want to maximize it and brandish that i am such a big devotee but we don't have to minimize it so if even for in a week we are able to read one and a half hours or one or two days or in a month we are able to read for a few hours on a few days that's also good it's better than not reading at all but uh if we maybe we could do both some days when we have the time and the inspiration we do more and some days we maintain regularity so we have to find what nourishes ourselves the best so you if for some devotees they may decide i will read 5 minutes every day but then the 5 minutes just comes and goes and they are not able to connect they are not able to absorb then it may become like a ritual so then that is not advisable you they, we don't want to just do something as a, it is it is a ritual but it should also become spiritual for us it should transform us gradually 
So what is required for that? Each one of us can find out. So if you find that you are nourished best by maybe reading one and a half hours, then that is the small, simple step for you. Make sure that you read for one and a half hours once in a week. It's of course better if you could read more daily. So it's not so much of correcting; it's just a matter of matter matter of doing what nourishes you. And sometimes even five minute, ten minute reading something can also nourish us. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah, I don't think there's anyone else. You can ask Madhu. And so there is no mention of the word guru in the Tadvidi Pranipata in a verse, and also it's in plural. It's referred to Gyani na Sattva Darshinaha. So, but we quote it as a prime reference from the Gita for the good principle of surrendering to a guru. Well, we have to understand that the Bhagavad Gita is a, and in, in some ways it's an emergency book. Uh, Arjuna was on a battlefield, and the battlefield you don't have. a lot of time for elaborate discussions so the uh, the bhagavad gita gives concisely things which are essential uh, for arjuna to understand now arjuna lived in a culture where he knew about all the paths of material life all the major paths of material life and spiritual life so Arjuna's question was not about how to follow a particular path; it was which path to follow. There are two different things. It's like you know, should I take Ayurveda or allopathy or naturopathy or Unani or uh, herbal medicine or whatever? Now, if you want to take herbal medicine, and there are whole books written for that, and if somebody already knows about these medicines, but that what treatment should I take? so then at that time the discussion will be about which treatment to take not how a particular treatment is to be taken so in general for no path krishna goes too much into the details if we consider the path of yoga there is a sixth chapter but even there how much is krishna talking about specific the yoga sutra as a patanjali go much more into specifics than what the bhagavad gita goes if we consider a bhakti Now Krishna doesn't talk about the specifics of bhakti also. See, with respect to yoga, Krishna doesn't talk about say the eight uh, ashtanga, the eight limbs. Krishna doesn't specifically delineate. Krishna doesn't talk about the states of the mind. Krishna doesn't mention the ashta siddhis. Similarly, with respect to deity, with respect to bhakti, Krishna doesn't um, specifically mention about deity worship. Krishna doesn't mention about uh, avataras, although the principle of avatar is there. but the word avatar doesn't come in the bhagavad gita the word archa vigraha or archa upasana doesn't come in the bhagavad gita so the bhagavad gita is not about specifics of any path it is about the 
analysis of which path to follow. That's why the specifics, specific terms or specific items of specific paths will not come in the Bhagavad Gita. So Krishna talks about the principle of uh, offering food to, of, of, of whatever we take, we should offer as offer to him. But it doesn't get into specifics about which food to offer and which food to not offer. That's why if you want to specifically find a verse which says that these are the foods to be eaten and these are the foods to not be eaten, you can have generic analysis in terms of goodness, passion, ignorance. But Krishna doesn't talk specifics over there. He doesn't give a list of these are the foods you shouldn't take on Ekadashi, these are the foods you should not take at all. Now, Arjuna doesn't need all that. So scripture has a part that is as a central core that is eternal, but scripture is also given in a particular context. And the context will inevitably shape the content. Um, so there are many things specifically in the Bhagavad Gita which are not mentioned, and we shouldn't consider that as a weakness. That's just a result of the context. Now, coming to the specific point of the word guru not being there, the, the culture over there was such that if you, the, if you can look at the Bhagavad Gita as a part of the Mahabharat, then there is an immense reverence towards Brahminical culture over there in general. And uh, the Pandavas, even when they're in the forest, repeatedly sages are meeting them and they're they are responding to the sages, they are hearing from the sages, learning from the sages. It's all very, it's very clear. And uh, that Tattva Darshinaha, that's very, very clear. And in general, the traditional culture uh, was what our movement is gradually moving toward. That, that, that this plural is very significant, Tattva Darshinaha. Why? Because in our real life, it's not that we learn only from one guru. We learn from many, many gurus. The, the Mahabharata itself is 100,000 verses. But the Mahabharata doesn't spare even half a verse to tell us who is the guru of the Pandavas. It doesn't, uh, you know, we could say, we ask Dev is one of the teachers. Drona is their martial guru. Dhaumya is their priest. But who is their initiating guru? That's not so important because the Guru is important, but the principle of what the Guru represents is even more important. And the, the Pandavas, they learn from so many people. They learn from Markandeya, from Narada, from Vyasa, from Parvat Muni, from so many other sages. And we see our movement started in a very historically anomalous, unusual situation. The Prabhupada had to transplant a whole culture. Uh, in a place where nobody knew about that culture. And that's why Prabhupada was almost like the be-all and end-all for his disciples. And although his books contain internal principles, his books were also written at a particular time in a particular context. So Prabhupada, in many ways, uh, stresses the position of the Guru much more than what is done in the tradition. And that is because that was what was required for transplanting the tradition at that time. We say Vishwanath Chakradakur quotes Yasya Prasad, Bhagavad Prasad, and how he was devoted to the spiritual master. Yes, that is true in terms of the bhava, in terms of sentiment. But Vishwanath Chakradakur, in his Bhagavad Gita or Bhagavatam commentaries, he hardly ever quotes his spiritual master. Balde Vidya Bhushan, in his Vedanta Sutra commentary, uh, never once quotes Vishwanath Chakradakur. Because you know, he is writing Vedanta Sutra commentary to reach out to people, to authorities from other traditions. And they are going to accept not the authorities of our tradition, they are going to accept universal authorities. So he quotes from the Upanishads, he quotes from the Puranas, he, not so much from the Puranas, Upanishads and uh, Bhagavad Gita, Shrutis, primary Smutis. So the Guru, the spiritual master is extremely important, but, but it is not the spiritual master is the be-all and end-all and nobody else matters. We learn from many, many gurus. And that is how our situation is in our movement. Now, we have our spiritual master, but we learn from so many other Vaishnavas also. And in a sense, uh, the way ISKCON started was anomalous, was, was different from what is standard. And as our movement is getting uh, more and more established, we are returning to what is the standard. That there is there is there, there is one spiritual master, but there is respect for the gurus. And that's why Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Uttapada Kamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamsha. 
So we have many, many teachers and we learn from all of them. And that is the principle that Krishna is presenting to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. And that's why that, is, that plural is there over there. Does it answer the question? Thank you. Is there any one more question or should we stop? Yes, yes. Okay, well, how do we? Well, it depends. It's not so. How do we uh, recite various other prayers apart from the, the holy names? The, it's uh, in the practice of bhakti, there is a lot of room for individuality. There is a standard process which we are practicing. But along with that standard process, there are there is a there is abundant room for individuality. So if we say, for example, even when we are chanting, some some may some devotees may like to have a picture of Radha Krishna in front of them because they are the divine couple whom we are calling. Some devotees may like to have a picture of the spiritual master. Some devotees may like to have Tulsi Maharani. Some devotees may just like to have a print out of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Some may just like to close their eyes, whatever. So uh, in the in in bhakti there are principles and there are preferences. So the principles are, are central and few. So for example, <clears throat> we could say the five potent limbs of bhakti which I talked about, we could say they are principles. Or so the idea that we have to chant the holy names, we have to worship the deities, we have to study Bhagavatam, associate with devotees. These are like principles. But, but within the principles and even apart from the principles, there are preferences. So I, we have to study the Bhagavatam, but some devotees may just decide, you know, I want to go deep into one pastime in the Bhagavatam. I don't want to just read the whole book. I want to go deep into the pastime and memorize many of the verses, memorize many of the prayers. And they may they may serve and worship the Bhagavatam that way. Somebody else may say, no, I want to the whole Bhagavatam is manifest. I want to read the whole thing. So later maybe I'll go deep, but I want to spread wide right now, which is also fine. So. Um, if we feel inspired, if we feel inspired by reciting certain words, sections, certain other prayers, that's wonderful. That if that is the way we are connecting with Krishna, that's excellent. So you could maybe do that at a separate time uh, and give some brief time, or even if during chanting also, if our mind starts wandering too much and we are not able to focus, then maybe just pause for a few minutes, maybe recite one or two prayers from the separate section that we have. And that creates a more devotional orientation and then start chanting again. So to if somebody starts uh, starts reg uh, mandating the preferences, then that will become fanatical. No, to start changing the principles will become sentimental. It will not it, it'll be, it will dilute us and we will contaminate. We will get cut away from the tradition. We'll get cut away from the tradition. But to start mandating on the preferences, I don't know that I am going to say on Ekadashi, no, I chant 64 rounds, so everybody else should also chant 64 rounds. No, 64 rounds inspires you wonderful. But I am inspired by reading the Bhagavatam. I am inspired by maybe by doing a lot of kirtan. Somebody else is inspired by reciting songs. Well, Ekadashi is a time for doing more bhakti. How specifically? We can't mandate preferences. Uh, so each of us has our preferences. Of course, we can talk with some senior devotee who's understanding, who's like-minded, and they make sure that according to our preferences, when we are going, we are going in the right direction. But each of these have each of us is an individual, each of us has an individual relationship with Krishna. 
and individual means we will have individual preferences so those can also be used to flavor the devotional offering that we are making to krishna does it answer your question so thank you very much shrila prabhupad ki krithraj shrimad bhagavatam ki ai gaur premanande hari hari bol gaur bhaktavinda ki jai hare krishna parvati sarva bhasta asindu bhivacha pavane bhyo krishna bhivyo namo namah hare krishna dandavat